Welcome, everyone. I've been assured that it's, uh, the clock says it's time to start and we should be punctual. Um, I'm Chair Jim Murray, Chair of the Animal Biology Graduate Group, and I would introduce our speaker today. And first off, I would like to thank the Storer Committee, the ability to have the Storer Endowment to fund speakers for graduate groups and major issues is a real plus on this campus for our graduate education. I think it's phenomenal. And it allows us to invite people who can give us very interesting talks like our speaker today. So uh, to introduce uh, Professor Georges, he got his DVM from the University of Liege, followed by a PhD from the Free University in Brussels. He then migrated to Salt Lake City, of all places, to work for Genmark for a number of years before returning to Liege and taking up an academic appointment. And uh, over the years, he has garnered a number of awards. We won't go into all of those. But he won the Wolf Prize in Agriculture in 2007. And he was inducted as a foreign associate of the US National Academy of Sciences uh, this year. And he's also a member of the Belgian Royal Academy of Medicine. So he has done a lot of things both within medicine and within livestock uh, genetics. Today he's going to talk to us on the genetic dissection of inherited predisposition to inflammatory bowel disease. So I will turn it over to Professor Michelle Georges. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, thank you very much to, to all of you for giving me the chance to, uh, to come here. So it's my first time in Davis and I had heard and was dreaming about many great things about Davis and it all turned to be true. So, it's really nice to be here. So my, my lab and uh, my life has been primarily, uh, or my scientific life has been devoted to animal genetics, but for the last, I don't know how many years, at least six, seven years, we've had a chance through interactions with uh, uh, medical doctors within our university to, to embark into uh, uh, complex diseases in human, common complex diseases in human. At some point there was this man which has become a good friend of me, Edouard Louis, he'll be in the acknowledgments, he's a gastroenterologist, and he had collected a nice uh, cohort of cases and controls for inflammatory bowel disease, but you know, he, there was not that much human genetics at the University of Liège at that time, and the best surrogate he could find was a vet doing uh, animal genetics, and I thought, you know, can't be that different, same methods, and, and I embarked into human genetics, and since then, you know, we, we, uh, we've continued to do that together and had a lot of fun. And uh, so that's what I would like you tell, to tell you about uh, today. And so I'll, I'll uh, take you on a tour where we have to go through, I don't, yeah, it's probably better like that. I'll, I'll try to get you through these uh, six points here. Uh, so the, essentially the first uh, two are relatively general and, and I assume that you're not all of you are not uh, on a daily basis dealing with the genetics of complex traits, so my apologies for those of you that do, but this is rather introductory. And then after that, I'll go into uh, more technical stuff, which corresponds to exactly what we're doing at, uh, at the present time, or at least trying uh, to do. So first, a few words about inflammatory uh, bowel disease and, and uh, somewhere emphasize the I'm not going to say antagonism, but the contribution of nurture and uh, nature. So inflammatory bowel disease, as you all probably know, is a uh, chronic inflammation of the intestinal tract that doctors classify primarily into two forms. One, the most common one, is called Crohn's disease, and a second very common one is called ulcerative colitis, and they they differ primarily in the types of lesions and more in the location of the uh, uh, lesions. So the, the picture I'm showing here is, is uh, uh, Bernil Bernard Crohn, who obviously gave his name to uh, one of the two forms, Crohn's disease, and he did that in the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And, and so we have, you know, the, the disease was probably there for a longer time, and you know, some people look at historical records and think this person, famous person, might actually have suffered from Crohn's disease. Uh, but on the other hand, I think there are good reasons to believe that prior to the description by Crohn of the disease to whom he gave, uh, or to which he gave his name, that this was a relatively uncommon condition. And so one of the striking things 
about Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease in general, as for a number of other inflammatory uh, conditions, is that their incidence, at least in the industrialized world, has increased in a fairly dramatic uh, way. So you could say this is just because doctors are getting better at diagnosing it, they recognize the condition better, but you know, talking to them, all of them would say this thing is increasing, and in fact continues to increase at a quite uh, dramatic rate. So when you read, you go through the literature and you play with the numbers, essentially, you know, I, I can't escape the conclusion that in our industrialized countries at the present time, one in 350 people approximately will suffer from either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis at some point in its, uh, in its lifetime. So, and, and so one of the other striking things is that the age of onset of the disease seems to be going down more and more. So it's becoming relatively uh, common to have uh, kids before the age of 15 and even now before the age of 10 that suddenly have uh, you know, uh, manifestations of severe uh, inflammatory uh, bowel disease. So, if all, so also what we see is that you know, it's a disease that was primarily uh, observed, as I said, in industrialized countries, and so this is actually a, a map that, that goes back approximately 10 years ago. But what we observe now is that with the, uh, the um, uh, way of life changing in developing countries, that the disease is more and more described in other parts of the world where before that it was, it was uh, essentially an exception. And so we see this kind of thing spreading and becoming a real quote-unquote pandemic, if I may uh, use that word. So clearly, uh, what that tells us is that there is an environmental factor here that we actually do not understand well at all that is the primary driver of this increase in the uh, incidence of, uh, of this disease. But we're not all equally susceptible to this uh, uncharacterized environmental trigger. So the table is not very good, but I'll, I'll uh, and I, I don't know whether you can read it from the back, but I'll lead you through the essential things here. So this is uh, from a paper from Stefan Schreiber a number of years ago, where essentially he is showing the key uh, metrics that people are using to try to quantify the importance of genetics in the epidemiology of the condition, if you want. And so, so two things are particularly uh, uh, convincing here. On the one hand, you have twin concordance, and we'll, we see here for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, which essentially means that we're going to uh, check the concordancy rate for monozygotic twins versus dizygotic twins. So imagine that you take a whole series of pairs of twins, which you put in two boxes, the monozygotic twins and the dizygotic twins, and imagine that you could say, I'm going only to look at one, one member of the pair, and if that individual is affected by Crohn's disease, I'm going to then check whether the other one was affected as well, and this is essentially giving you the concordancy rate. And so what we see here is, for instance, for Crohn's disease, depending on the studies, the uh, concordancy rate goes between 0 and 4% in the literature as reported at that time for dizygotic twins, and is above 50% for monozygotic twins. And, and you may think a little bit about that, and you, it's very difficult to escape the conclusion that what that tells us is that there is a major environmental component in this inherited predis in this predisposition to Crohn's disease. So there is a major inherited uh, component to the predisposition. And another measure is the relative risk for uh, kins of an affected individual, and especially SIPs. So if uh, you are affected by Crohn's disease, the probability that your brothers and sisters are going to suffer from the, the same disease is increased by a factor of 20 to 50 when compared to the risk that an, ind as, uh, an individual that is randomly sampled in the population has to be affected by the disease. So all that tells us that although clearly the epidemiology of inflammatory bowel disease involves a major environmental trigger, which is not defined, we're not all uh, equally susceptible to this trigger, and uh, the, the variation in susceptibility is to a large extent uh, the reflection 
of differences in the genetics of the uh, individuals. So if you have any questions, don't, don't hesitate, interrupt me, and I'll be happy to clarify things if they, they were not. So, so that's interesting uh, for a number of reasons, but I think it's also an opportunity for those who are interested to gain a better understanding of the pathogenesis of what this disease is all about, including with the ambition or the hope that this improved comprehension will lead to a better prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of the, the disease. So just from a very practical point of view, you may want to study this disease in a variety of ways, but knowing that there is a strong inherited component to predisposition gives you an in route, a way to probably learn a number of things of what causes uh, uh, this disease. So what we are going to try to do is we're going to try to identify the genetic variants in our genome that, and a genetic variant, I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute, so these are regions in the genome for which some individuals have one variant, have one for SNPs, for instance, one base pair, while at the same position other individuals have another uh, base pair. And so there are plenty of those in the genome, and what we'll try to do is we'll try to identify those that are responsible, that underlie the heritability, as we call it, with regards to inherited uh, predisposition. Now, this, this, this genetic variants, what they are doing is that they are changing the way uh, genes, typically in the immediate vicinity of these variants, are operating, and it is the, the change in the way these genes are operating that are directly responsible for the fact that some individuals have a higher chance to suffer from this disease than uh, other individuals. So that's something that has been going around for a while, although there has been an explosion of positive results over the last five years. But if you look at the, the history of these, of these uh, genetic analysis, I think we can align the sequence, linkage, GWAS, and uh, uh, meta-analysis. So this is just an illustration of what I was uh, mentioning before. So if we compare the genome that we have received from our father, the paternal genome, with the genome that we have received from our mother, imagine that we could walk on these two genomes and read the corresponding sequence. There are, just for these two, quote unquote, randomly selected genomes, a large number of differences. So, uh, so one copy of a genome is three billion base pairs long. And if we compare two randomly selected genomes, the one I got from my father and the one I got from my mother, and if I look at the differences, they will be of the order of three million differences. And these differences can either be so-called SNPs, a, a instead of a G, a C instead of a T. They can be microsatellites, where we have tandem repetitions, where the variation is in the number of repeats. There are copy number variants. There are plenty of different variants. The most abundant ones are the SNPs. The vast majority of these millions of variants are probably neutral with respect to how the genome functions, but the minority of them will have a direct effect on the functioning of one or more genes and will therefore affect the phenotype of the individual, some of these phenotypes being inherited predisposition to all the diseases that we uh, know of. So, okay, so we're going to try to identify amongst these millions of variants those that are, that are underlying inherited predisposition. And, and when we were young, if I may say so, the way we were trying to do that, including in animals, was first by trying to locate them roughly into the genome by a process called linkage analysis. So the fact that we have so many variants means that every chromosome is in fact unique. And if you have the ability to see all these variants, it's literally like if you could color chromosomes. You can distinguish all the chromosomes from each other, and you can actually track these, the segregation, as we see, of these chromosomes through pedigrees. And so linkage analysis just means that you try to see whether some parts of the genome when they move from, from generation to generation, whether they track the disease. That would be linkage. Um, it was the first method that was actually applied, including to common complex diseases like inflammatory bowel disease. So the first step would be to try to determine the rough localization 
of the gene or genes we are interested in. So imagine one of our 23 pairs of chromosomes. Linkage would essentially tell you there is something is interesting happening on chromosome one, the upper third or something like that. The resolution was uh, approximately a, a large chunk of a chromosome. That contains hundreds, if sometimes, sometimes thousands of genes, so you would like to refine the map position. And you can look at something else, which is called linkage disequilibrium. It's the same kind of correlation between a specific chromosome segment and the presence or absence of the disease, but it's a correlation that holds at the population level in addition to the family level. So the only thing is that to be able to detect that, you need a much higher, you need to, to interrogate, as we say, a much higher number, a, a more dense map of variants. So when you do linkage analysis, you need few arrows. You don't need very many arrows. But once you try to fine map a gene, you need a much higher density of markers. And then you can start to look for correlations that will apply across families, that is at the population level. So this is called linkage equilibrium, which is now more, the term that is more often used is association mapping. And this can lead you to small regions of the genome where you, know, you only have to deal with a very a handful of genes. You're getting closer and closer to what you're looking for. And that's what people were manipulating until, in fact, very recently. And for the vast majority of common complex diseases, it has been a real disaster. People haven't found anything, except for inflammatory bowel disease, where there is a, a uh, textbook example of this process. So a gene which is known to have a major, but I will qualify what I mean by major, a major effect on inherited predisposition to Crohn's disease only, not to ulcerative colitis, is a so-called NOT2 gene. And in fact, this figure in the paper, by, in the Nature paper by, by Jean-Pierre Hugo, essentially recapitulates my previous figure. So you see linkage analysis and then linkage is equilibrium analysis, and you'll see later some other uh, uh, approaches. But that's really, you know, that's pretty much the only uh, success story that people could show in the entire field of human genetics focusing on common complex traits, you know, before the, the year 2000. So what this shows you is essentially the evolution of the number of mutations and genes, affected genes, that were identified between 1985 and a little bit after 2000, where one distinguishes in pink monogenic traits, what we call Mendelian traits, versus complex diseases such as diabetes, hypertension, inflammatory bowel disease. So the upper pink thing shows you that the genetic methods that emerged in the 90s were extremely good at picking up the genes underlying genetic defects, Mendelian traits, but were terrible for the identification of genes underlying what was clearly a important heritability for traits such as uh, Crohn's disease. And then there was a, a, a key publication in 96 that, that argued that the, the whole linkage approach was doomed to fail for a number of technical reasons that I'm not going to explain. But what they were proposing was a radically different approach, which, has, which is now known under the acronym GWAS, Genome-Wide Association Studies. And essentially it said, you know, what the only thing we need is we need to have uh, uh, hundred thousands of SNPs, or in the paper I think it was a million SNPs uh, across the genome, and we need large cohorts of cases and controls. You know, at that time probably we were already saying thousand cases and thousand controls, if not more. And then by this approach that directly uses linkage equilibrium, we should be able to find what we are looking for. Now, so a million SNPs at that time was oh, a very nice idea, but that doesn't exist. And 1,000 cases in controls were still, you know, they were large numbers. But nevertheless, you know, driven by the U.S. where everything is possible, like in California, essentially people started to write grants or start companies to actually achieve this uh, objective. It, it was like always, you know, quite controversial because there were a series of underlying hypotheses that some people thought were were uh, valid and others not, and that remains actually a, an, an, an important 
point of discussion. So, for instance, the common disease, common variant hypothesis. For those of you that are familiar with these things or the common disease, rare variant hypothesis are still things which are being discussed. Nevertheless, there has been incredible progress, and I'll show you uh, in a minute especially how that uh, applies to inflammatory uh, bowel disease. But so for, for the things that had to be put into place to be able to implement the approach proposed by Rich and Mary Kangas, we needed to have plenty of SNPs, and there was a, a community effort uh, that was put into place, the HAPMAP project, to generate this information. And then companies you know, have played an incredibly important role. They have very rapidly developed these tools that allow you to interrogate millions of SNPs in one uh, experiment. And the whole, the whole tribe of human geneticists started to apply that on all their favorite diseases, and it started to rain uh, results to the point that in 2007, you know, it was the break, G was, was the scientific breakthrough of the year. So if I, I summarize what, what uh, happened in uh, inflammatory bowel disease, so there were first three or four individual GWAS. So you have these individual laboratories, including ours, that are in the good old fashioned way doing it in their own corner and trying to beat their, their neighbors. So, so you had in the, U, in the US you had a cohort, in Germany you had a cohort, in the UK you had a cohort, in Belgium you had a cohort, and everybody's very happy because everybody can publish his GWAS and everybody comes up with his, pretty much his, his gene. And then you're stuck and you say, God, I have no alternative. I have to work together with my collaborators. And so you have this notion of meta-analysis that is coming into play. And in fact, you start this by you start to see this biomedical community that starts to work more and more like, like, like physicists. You know, they work with these big consortia. And so what you see here, I'm not even showing the results of the individual studies, you see three meta-analyses that have been, con you know, that were finished in 2008, 10, and 12, where essentially this consortium became bigger and bigger, and by merging forces, by merging these cohorts, and in the end, reaching a cohort in which we have a total of 70,000 individuals, approximately equally divided cases and controls. So the, the result at the end is 163 regions in the genome that are, uh, that are contributing to inherited predisposition to uh, Crohn's disease. So what we, what we see is that you know, these traits are incredibly uh, poly, polygenic. So there are lots of loci that are involved. So what has this generated in terms of what the objective is, you know, to understand the pathogenesis better and possibly uh, imagine more effective uh, uh, treatments? So, so, so just these, these scans have essentially given us an unprecedented insight in what pathways are involved into or when, when perturbed, in this case, genetically, can actually affect the predisposition to uh, disease. So for instance, autophagy uh, is a molecular mechanism that there was absolutely no evidence of any link between autophagy and, and uh, inflammatory bowel disease before. Well, you know what we see is that in these 163 loci, there seems to be an enrichment in genes whose only known function is autophagy. Then, for instance, the TH17 and interleukin-23 pathways were suddenly coming up as playing a very important role. And so one of the interesting results was that it's actually better to be a little bit deficient in this signaling pathway. It protects you against uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So for instance, here, so we see that the, the, the variants in the interleukin-23 receptor that are associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, well, these mutations are actually enriched in controls rather than in cases. So they clearly affect the way the gene function in a negative way. They perturb the gene, and, and by doing that, they are uh, protective against uh, inflammatory bowel disease. So I think another, so this table is, of course, difficult to read, but it's just to make two points. So the first, the first point is that what also came out of these studies is uh, this notion of pervasive pleiotropy. So there is a fact that, of course, some people do it for inflammatory bowel disease, but in the meantime, other people do it on a bunch of other uh, common complex diseases. And you realize that a, a, a large proportion of the loci that are found for inflammatory bowel disease are also found for a series of 
other disease. So there's a lot of overlap in these, the genetic determinism of inherited predisposition to diseases which were before that considered to be completely independent uh, entities. And then the fact that there are lots of loci also indicates that the effect of each one of these loci is in fact very modest. So, so, what, so this column was telling us this locus affects uh, ulcerative colitis, ankylosing spondylitis, psoriasis, etc. So these are all the diseases that are affected in addition to Crohn's disease by the corresponding locus. And this column here are the odds ratios. And so you see that the top one is not two, I don't know whether, where he is, but the second one is interleukin-23 receptor, it's uh, odds ratios of 2.66. So if you have one of the risk alleles, your risk is increased by 2.6. But for all the other ones, we are at approximately 1.1 to 1.2. So the risk to do the disease, if you have one of these risk alleles, is increased, but very, 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 very modestly. In fact, this has been the reason why a number of people criticized GWAS. They said, you know, there's absolutely no value in knowing this, this, this thing because the effect is very, very modest. I think that's, a, that's not a valid criticism. So it is not because the mutations that are common in our population and which affect predisposition to Crohn's disease have a modest effect that perturbing the corresponding pathway pharmacologically, for instance, might not have a big effect. As a matter of fact, the variations that are found to be common in our population in those genes, to be common, have had to resist natural selection. And so it's very possible that the, we don't find big effects or when we look at common variants, just because the, the big effects have been pushed out of the population or at least at very low uh, frequency. So I think that the fact that these effects are small absolutely doesn't uh, mean that the biology we learn about the genes in these regions is not uh, essential. And another point is that there are 163 loci, they have modest effects, that's just another way of showing the, the size of the effects, but now using a, a, a measure of variance. So typically when we look at inherited risk, geneticists use, manipulate, an unseen phenotype, which they call the underlying liability, which is a normally distributed phenotype. And we work a lot with this underlying liability. And so we can calculate the mean and the variance of in the, this underlying liability. And we can quantify how much of the total variance is explained by individual loci. And so what you see here is, after one of these, these studies, you see that the vast majority of the identified loci explained around a fifth of a percent of the variance for this trait. So very, very small effects. Now there are lots of them, so we can sum them and see how much we explain of the whole heritability with these 163 loci. And at that time, you know, you reach the conclusion that you explain around, let's say, a quarter of the genetic component of the liability, which is, let's say, approximately half of the liability. So even after 163 loci, I think we are at approximately 13% of the whole liability, or approximately a quarter of the genetic component of the heritability. As regard, you know, where is the rest? And that's this whole missing heritability uh, thing. So that was my first part, is to give, for those of you that are not geneticists of complex traits, some some background about where we are, uh, what the context is of our studies. And so now to go deeper into what we are doing at the present time, and so other people are doing other things, so I'll tell you what our lab is uh, trying to, uh, to uh, achieve. So what I'm doing here is I'm showing you a graph, which is not from us, it's from the people from the Sanger, I think, where I zoom into one of these 162 peaks. So, so just to make sure you're, you're on the same wavelength, so we are, so this would be, for instance, typically a so-called Manhattan plot that one can obtain for a disease like Crohn's disease. Every one of these, so this is the genome. We alternate colors when we go from one chromosome to the other one. Every time I have a peak here, it's because the, in that region there is something happening that affects inherited predisposition to uh, Crohn's disease. So now I'm gonna zoom into one of these peaks. 
And if I zoom into one of these peaks, I typically see something like this here. So what I see is that the peak extends over a region which, on average, measures 250,000 base pairs. And in 250,000 base pairs, on average, you have 4.5 genes. So this is a typical example. I have one, two, three, four, five, six genes. There are always genes called interleukin something, and so you're always tempted to say that's the responsible one, but there are interleukins everywhere, and there are plenty of genes with a bizarre name and unknown function, and it's a, it's a bad, bad uh, ID to rush on the ones that by chance have been called interleukin something. So in fact, there are genes in there, and we don't know which gene is in fact the one that is, whose function is perturbed by the variants underlying uh, inherited predisposition. So having a locus doesn't mean that we have identified a gene, and the reality is that in the whole field of the studies of common complex diseases in humans, the cases where people can really demonstrate that they have identified the causative gene are a minority of genes. For the vast majority of loci, we don't know formally what the causative gene is. Some people say, I'm sure it's that one, but they don't use the term sure in the same way as geneticists do it. So we're not sure for the vast majority of these loci. So the other thing is that in a region of 250 KB, you have a very large number of variants. If you look at, if you look at a population of 70,000 individuals, cases and controls, and if you were to look at all the variant positions that you have found in that sample, you would have ten, tens of thousands of variant positions. Not all these variants are affecting the way the gene functions. You see that many of them go up in the graph. That means that the fact that they are, that means that they are associated with the disease. But for the vast majority of these dots corresponding to variants or SNPs, they just go up because they are correlated, they are in linkages equilibrium with the causative SNPs in this region, which are a minority. There are a needle in the haystack, maybe one, two, three, four, five. We don't know exactly how many, but very few when compared to all the SNPs you have in this region. And the question is, which are the causative variants that are directly responsible for the inherited predisposition, for which the signal is a real direct signal and not a signal that just reflects an association, a correlation? And so we don't know, we have a locus, but we don't know the gene, and we don't know the variants. And so what we are trying to do in the lab is to identify causative genes and identify causative variants and try to develop methods so that we can do that in a systematic uh, way. So I'll start by telling you what we do with regards to the uh, variants. And so we want to know that because we want to know what are the molecular mechanisms that are leading to the predisposition, but also because if we could identify all the, the causative SNPs, we would be in an ideal diagnostic uh, position. So the issue that we are facing is that the top SNP may not be causative. So typically people until now, what they did is they took the top SNP, they calculated the odds ratio, the frequency, and they said this slope is explained so much. So they said this is the strongest signal, so it has to be the causative SNP. I'm simplifying a little bit, but not that much. In fact, that's not true. So the top SNP may be the most strongly associated without being causative. So in animal genetics or in mouse genetics, we've known that for a long time, and we called before these, these artifacts, so-called ghost QTL. So you can imagine that you have two causative variants that are associated each with a variant that is a neutral variant, but the neutral variant absorbs, if I may say so, signal from the two causative SNPs, and by adding that up, has a signal that is actually stronger than the two other ones. So you have to be careful to just rush towards the top SNP. And then it's obvious that even if the top SNP was causative, some of the other variants might as well be causative. So if you look at monogenic diseases in humans, Genetic heterogeneity, which means that there are multiple causative variants, is pretty much the rule. And although they are not identical in their behavior from a population genetics point of view, I think everything 
points towards the fact that allelic heterogeneity is also going to be the rule for the low side underlying complex diseases. So we have to untangle these, these things and it's a difficult problem, but a good part of the solution lies in the fact that you can't just run these association analysis one marker at the time. You should estimate, evaluate the effect of each variant conditional on the effects of all the other ones. So you, you should apply conditional uh, models. And so together with the International IBD Genetics Consortium and especially three teams, we are trying to apply that on the on 102 of the 163 loci that were described in uh, Justin's uh, paper. And so we do that with a subset of the available cases and controls that share in common the fact that they have been genotyped with a specific array which is called the immunochip array, that's a detail, but this gives you an idea about the number of samples that we are uh, dealing with. And uh, so the immunochip uh, had approximately 150,000 SNPs, if I remember well, that were concentrated on specific regions of the genome. And to really maximize the amount of information, we do something which is quite standard now in human genetics. So what we do is we impute uh, genotypes of additional variants by using information from the 1,000 genomes project. So, so we have genotype, let's say, 1,000 markers in a given region, but we're going to predict the genotype of the individuals in our cohort for plenty of ungenotyped variants that we find in this 1,000 genomes project, a project where thousands of individuals from the same and other ethnic groups have been uh, sequenced. This is not a trivial exercise, and it is driven by uh, Mark Daly's group at the Broad and Jeff Barrett at the Sanger uh, Institute. Okay, so then there are a variety of uh, ways to try to do these conditional analyses. And one relatively standard way of doing things which is applied by the Broad group and the Sanger group is for statisticians here so-called forward selection. So the whole problem is a problem of model, uh, you know, finding the, the best possible statistic model given all the data you have. And one relatively simple way of doing things is scan the region of interest one marker at a time, take the top one, and I say, oh, that's dangerous, fix it in the model, scan again, and so do that sequentially. And so we don't like to do that amongst other reasons because of this problem of ghost uh, effects. So what we have essentially done, and so for the animal geneticists in the room, we've tried to adapt the methods, the Bayesian methods that are used in animal selection for a process called genomic selection, I'll come back to that, to these very specific loci. So imagine that this is a locus where you have plenty of markers and you would like to identify the causative ones in the whole uh, haystack. So the first thing we do is we cluster the variants based on linkage disequilibrium. So essentially what it means if you are a statistician is that some of these markers behave exactly in the same way. They are highly correlated. So throughout the cohort, they behave, in, they behave in exactly or nearly exactly the same way. So there's in fact no way to untangle them genetically. So you might as well consider them as one object. And in fact, that's what we are doing. If you're interested in biology, so if you look at the region, so that's, that's a figure from the first HapMap paper, where they focus on a region and they show the different haplotypes that exist in that region, and they reconstruct the, if you will, phylogenetic tree that relates the history, or that, that essentially uh, uh, shows you the history, the way in which these different haplotypes have evolved from each other. What these clusters are doing is they're essentially looking at groups of SNPs that are on these horizontal branches. So what we're going to do is we are going to interrogate these SNPs as a group, which essentially means I'm going to contrast all these haplotypes against all these haplotypes. And then I have another cluster, which is, for instance, here, which means that I'm going to contrast these two haplotypes against all the other ones. So in fact, by doing that, we really dissect the, the, the haplotype tree and we interrogate these groups of SNPs. So within a group like that, you have no way to distinguish them, which is why we uh, group them. And then we apply a, a Bayesian method, and just you know, for the specialists in the room, so, 
So we, we, these Bayesian methods assume an underlying liability with a threshold. So we still have something that may not be true at all, which is we consider that the effects are additive. We correct for population stratification by including principal components in the, in the model. And then we use these methods that are, it's just common sense, be prudent when you test multiple things. You have to regress things towards the mean. In animal genetics, we typically do that by applying blob uh, methods. And here we apply things that have a similar effect, so-called lasso. And then to solve these complicated things, we use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, methods where we have two types of procedures that intermingle, Gibbs sam sampling and metro metropolis uh, hasting. So just to, to, visual, to, to show that in a more intuitive way, so essentially what we do is we will sample out of these multiple clusters that we have in a locus, we will sample sets of 20 because we think that it's unlikely that there would be more than 20 independent effects in the locus. So we sample things pretty much at random. We take 20 at random. And then having selected these 20, we, and this, is, this is done using a metropolis uh, hasting decision uh, making process in whether you choose these 20 or another 20. And then once you have selected them, you try to estimate the effects of the 20 guys you have selected by, by GIP sampling. And you keep doing that a very, very large number of times in a chain fashion. So it's not that you start from scratch every time. So you, you use as a starting position the previous cycle. So you try to move progressively towards, one could say, something that fits the data better, which is a little bit oversimplified but that's the way these uh, uh, methods work. And then we have, uh, we have defined criteria to analyze the results and decide what are the likely uh, causative uh, uh, clusters. So I'll give you an example for not to. Of course, you could say it's the, it's the easiest case because it's the biggest effect. Log one over P, th 300. So P value 10 to the minus 300. So these things are extremely uh, significant. If you use a standard approach, one SNP at a time, this is the pattern that you get. So you have this one SNP here, the top SNP that is extremely uh, significant. Of course, for that we know that there are more effects, but that's what you get. When you use our methods, and I'll just show you again to give you an idea, the results of the Bayesian methods, you suddenly see a whole bunch of other effects that are popping up. And so these are independent effects. So what you see is that once you rerun the analysis in a way that where you estimate things conditionally, you see that out of the noise, out of the thousands of markers, there are a series of markers that are coming up with their own independent effect. Now there are problems here because of linkage equilibrium. So we've the clustering approach adds a series of clusters where we cannot untangle the effects within the cluster, but we know that within that cluster there is also an independent uh, effect. And so essentially what, so this is, uh, I'll lead you through it, it's a table that is trying to summarize the key findings for a locus such as NOT2. So what we identified was 13 independent effects. And, and so we can potentially go, go deeper, but being relatively prudent, we identified in this locus 13 different independent effects. So to convince ourselves that they are true, we try to fall back to standard decision-making with a p-value. So we fit all these things together in a logistic regression and we estimate the p-value of each cluster conditional on all the other ones and we have extremely significant results. So this is uh, log one over p. Now, how good is our resolution in terms of identifying the causative variance? So this line here is the number of variants within each one of these clusters. So it's 2, 1, 1, 1, 1, 11, 1, 1, 1, 5, 1, 7, 1. But that means that for the majority of these things, we really go and pick out the causative variant out of the haystack with, an, with an, I think, an incredible level of uh, precision. Now, to convince ourselves that these things are, are real in addition to the logistic regression, and I'll show you more later, we, you know, we look at evidence that they might actually be biologically relevant. So are these synonymous or non-synonymous variants? If you have an NS, it means that they are non-synonymous. So the three variants here were known 
uh, certainly known before, but we pick out a series of other ones, sometimes very rare, that are non-synonymous variants and are most likely causative variants. Then some of things fall in introns or intergenic regions, and what this shows you is the fast comes score. So it's a measure of conservation throughout evolution within mammals. So, so here, like, you, you pick one SNP in the middle of nowhere, and boing, it has a fast comb score of 97%. So it's extremely conserved throughout evolution. I think, you know, strong evidence that it is really a causative SNP. So the method really seems to be capable of dissecting these loci in a, uh, in a rather uh, precise fashion. So this is the present situation. I'll, I'll, I'll give a few slides to summarize the present situation where we merge the results that we obtain with our method with the results that, we, that are obtained at the Broad and at the Sanger. Clearly, like usually, you know, they have, uh, they're complementary. So one method, so the, most of the things are found jointly. So at the present time, we are at 137 independent effects. 107 of those are found by the two methods or the three methods. And then each method finds 15 on its own perfectly politically correct. So how many, how many effects do we find per locus? On average, 1.4. But I think that's, that's more reflecting the fact that we are very conservative than anything else. So the p-value has to be 10 to the minus 6 for good reasons before we are prepared to show it to the, the world, if I may say so. But so there are many others that are 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 4, and that are probably true. But, but just to be on the safe side, we, we, uh, you know, we are still quite stringent. So this is the number of variants per cluster. So, so we would find, let's say, around 25 where there is only one. So we think we have causative mutations for around 25. Then we have 30 or so for which we can't choose. So the cluster contains between one and five SNPs. So here it's, the resolution is good but not perfect. And then, of course, there are a certain number of clusters where, because of linkages equilibrium, you can't, you can't choose sometimes amongst 100 SNPs that are in perfect uh, linkages equilibrium. So are these things real? Well, so for instance, if we look at the percentage, the fraction of non-synonymous variants amongst the positive clusters that contain only one variant, so we think we have the causative variants, the, the proportion of non-synonymous variants is 20%. And if you look at controls, we are at around 1%. We have a very high and, and very significant enrichment in things that are non-synonymous non and therefore most likely causative. In fact, there has been some discussion about, for common complex traits, what is the proportion of causative variants that is affecting the protein structures versus regulating the level of expression. You know, nobody is difficult to, to, to say, and I think this is, this is probably... Uh, a good estimate of what these proportions uh, might be. And this is higher than what people thought until uh, relatively recent ago. Then another thing, I won't give you the, result, the results in, deta in, in details, but so when, when we analyze these loci using the method that I described, we, we point towards clusters where we say these are containing, are containing causative uh, variants. So we know that we, we miss some. And so what we wanted to be able to do is to have an idea about how well the method had performed on a given cluster. So we wanted to have an idea of how much the locus accounted for in terms of variance and how much the clusters that we had pinpointed as being positive captured from the locus. And so what you see here is across these 102 loci, if I only take the top SNP, which is what people would have done so far, I would explain around 15% of the uh, heritability. If I now take the positive cluster, so I'm now adding information in each locus because I go and get additional uh, uh, clusters, I'm moving this thing up. What I think is interesting is that, you know, we're still missing a substantial proportion of the variance because if I now calculate as good as I can the complete variance explained by these 102 loci, I'm actually getting close to 35%. But so what that means is that a significant fraction of the missing heritability 
in fact lies within the law side that we have identified. It's just that to quantify it properly, you have to be able to pinpoint the causative variants that were in there. So if I, if I still have time, so okay. So so I'll try to give you an idea about uh, causative genes. So to to identify causative genes as a geneticist, you would like to have a formal a formal test of of causality. And if you scan the literature and the fields, you will see that people that work with model organisms, especially yeast and Drosophila, it's actually the the the, the test here was designed by David. Uh, Stern from Princeton at the time. So it's called reciprocal hemizygosity. So I have no time to, exp you know, I'm going to need 10 minutes to explain that, so I'm not going to do that. But if you want to have a, a ah moment where you say, gosh, genetics is beautiful, go and try to understand this, this thing. Problem, it's hard to apply on humans because you have to generate knockout humans and, and it's going to take a bit of time. So do we, have a, do we have an alternative here? Well, in fact, there is an alternative, which I think is very elegant. And this figure is coming out of the paper that I showed you before with not two. So a paper from nine, 2000, and I forgot what, what year when they, they, they published not two. But within the paper, they apply this very elegant test of causality. So what they do is, having identified the gene by linkage analysis and association analysis based on common variants, they sequence their strongest candidate gene in controls and in cases. I think it was around 200 cases and 200 controls. And they look for rare variants. So the, the, the y-axis here is a frequency. And so what you see is that in the controls, they essentially only find three non-synonymous variants in this gene, and their respective frequencies correspond to the height of the bar. But if you do the same thing in a cohort of affected individuals, you have a completely different pattern you see all these extremely rare non-synonymous variants. So you have a, a completely different mutational loads of the culprit gene in the cases in the control. And you can think about that and say that it is only one explanation. This is the causative gene. So this, the burden test, that's the name that is now given to this test, is a test of causality of genes. So, so I don't know why, but the results that they obtained in this paper where the cumulative frequency was 5% in controls versus 17% in the cases. If we do that today, I'll show you the results. We never get to these figures. So this was a complete overestimate of the, I don't know if it's winner's curse, but we know that the effect is much more, the actual effect is much more modest. But still, we think this, and everybody thinks that this is certainly a very efficient and elegant way to try to pinpoint the causative genes. So again, for reasons that I will not explain, you have to be very careful when you apply this test because it's not powerful at all. So it requires huge sample sizes because you go for a signal coming for very, very rare uh, variants. And so you may have seen in the literature recently several whole exome scans for common complex diseases which have essentially yielded zero results or nearly. And the reason, one of the reasons is that I think people have been too greedy so they wanted to sequence the entire genome, test every gene with a sample size that given the effects that one could expect, were, it was impossible actually to test that many genes because you, you are penalized for multiple testing and so you, you actually don't have the power to do that. So you, when you apply the burden test today, and if you don't want to get the budget to, to go through the roof, you have to apply it on genes for which you have really good reasons to believe that they might be causal. So one way is to say, I only do it on genes that map to GWAS hits, but we think we can actually go one step further. So what we think is that, uh, so we've seen that 20% of the variants are non-synonymous, which means that 80% of the causative variants are regulatory. So what it means is that they affect the way, uh, the, the level of expression of a given gene. So what that means is that if I could assay the level of expression of the genes that I'm interested in, I should if I look in the right tissue, at some point I should see an EQTL effect with an association pattern that mimics the association pattern with the disease. Okay, what, what did I say here? So I'm trying to illustrate this here. So this is a graph where I zoom in a given region of the genome and I show you two results on top of each other. In black, it's the result of the 
association with Crohn's disease. It's exactly the same pattern as before, dots going up and down. Okay, that's the, the, what, I, what I obtain in this region when I study the association between the SNPs and the disease. And the red thing is completely different. I go in a completely different sample but coming out of the same ethnic population and I assay the level of expression of a given gene that is located in this region at the position of the, the green vertical bar in a given tissue that I think is relevant regarding the disease, maybe an immune cell, and I, I look at the effect of SNPs on the level of expression of this gene in this tissue. And when I do that, again, I can see that some SNPs are associated with a log one over P value. I have what I call an expression association pattern. And so what you see here is that the red pattern and the black pattern look very much alike. Exactly the prediction of the effect of a regulatory variant underlying predisposition to disease. It's affecting the gene and thereby the predisposition to the disease. The prediction is that these things should be the same. This is just another way of representing the correlation between what is red and what is black in this pattern. There are many of EQTL. It's not because you have an EQTL in the same region that the two things should be related. If they are not related, red and black should be completely different. That's what you see here. When you look at the correlation, that's the kind of pattern you get. So what we try to do is to do that systematically for all the genes in the genome in as many tissues as possible, okay? And try to find things like that. Correlations come in two forms, negative slope, positive slope, important for the pharmaceutical industry. Increase in expression, decrease in uh, risk. Increase in expression, increase in risk. If I develop a pharmaceutical product that will knock out a pathway, I'll do that if I find an association like, uh, like that. So we, what we've done is we started to generate data to be able to, to do that systematically. And so at the present time, we have collected samples from 350 healthy individuals. The fact that they are healthy, we'll discuss later. Many people have difficulties with the fact that they are healthy. And so we took blood uh, from which we, we purified CD4, CD8, CD19, CD14, CD15 cells and platelets. And we took intestinal biopsies of these individuals at the end of the ileum, two locations in the colon and the, and the rectum. And so then we have subjected this cohort to a whole series of analysis. We genotype them, we SNP arrays, we impute everything we can from the 1000 Genome Project. We assay the expression of all the genes. At the present time, it's finished with, uh, with arrays in all nine cell types, and we are generating RNA-seq data. In two tissues, we have uh, assayed genome-wide methylation. We've, at every location in the, in the gut, uh, assayed the microbiota using 16S ribosomal RNA sequencing, and we are in the process of generating metabolome data by mass spec from plasma. So we think we have a very rich data set, even if at the present time, if you look competitively internationally, um, I would like to add a zero to this uh, cohort, but when I tell the people in the lab that they throw tomatoes at me, so. So then what we do is we go systematically, we do this EQTL analysis, and I have no time to, to detail that, but of course there are plenty of EQTL, and we, we like to know, you know, was it really worthwhile to go after nine tissues or not? So the people that do these studies now, they say, well, maybe it's enough to look at one tissue, you're gonna see the same thing. So there are discussions about that. I think our results show that it's not enough to take one tissue. There is a substantial fraction of regulatory activity that is cell-specific. We're gonna tell you about that. Uh, uh, so then, did we take the right cells? So we take multiple cells, and we think it's good to take multiple cells, but did we take the right cells? And we can do some calculations to show that we indeed think that we, we took disease-relevant cell types, and then we develop a a, a website in which all this information is made available to the public in what we hope will be a useful way. You can select your locus, select your genes, and all the information uh, is there. And so by doing that, so we are in the middle of that experiment, but I'll show you preliminary results of the next step. So what we do is we rank the genes based on this correlation pattern in just two minutes. And so Momo, quite a while ago, identified, which is one of the postdocs in the lab, identified 20 genes that were amongst the top in generating these correlated patterns between the disease association and the expression association. 
And then you go into this burden test. So now you have selected candidate genes to subject to this burden test based on functional data. And now we're going to sequence them. And so what we do now is we sequence these genes in 3,000 cases and 3,000 controls. So there are big experiments. If we're not that rich, so we have to play with pools, which is not ideal, but we play with pools. We do, the, do the, all that on Illumina, and so we developed uh, software to analyze the results. And so the results are, are, are here. They're not perfect, but they are here. So the experiment has a certain number of positive controls. So here you see NOT2, interleukin-23 receptor, and CARD9 that has bec become a, a positive control during the experiment because it was described by the, the broad group. But so what you see here is the difference in frequency between cases and control cumulatively for non-synonymous variants, for variants that are predicted to be deleterious or damaging by SIFT and polyphane respectively. And so the columns in which you have colors are the p-values computed with this permutation test. And so what you see is that our positive controls come up very positive in these in this analyses and systematically. So at least the whole thing works and we're able to sort through all the mess that uh, next generation sequencing is generating uh, and see a real signal. So what do we get with the genes that, that uh, Momo proposed to analyze? So we don't have a single one at the present time that is giving us a p-value that would come close to not to an interleukin-23 receptor that would resist multiple testing. But what we see is that we have an excess in low p-values. So per column here, I would expect to have two, two colored bins, if you want, and I typically have three times that many. So although, strictly speaking, the signal now is not significant yet, there is a tendency for the p-values to shift towards low p-values. So what it tells us is that you know, this burden test may work, but you need to sequence lots of individuals. So we're in the process of sequencing an additional 3,000 cases and 3,000 uh, controls. So we're, we're scanning through the data here and trying to uh, uh, do that. Okay, so I'm not going to talk about this. I'm going to go straight to the uh, acknowledgments. So, uh, of course, all this would, only, would not be possible if you didn't have access to these cohorts. So of course, we're very grateful to the patients that participate and the people that provide samples, but especially to all the clinicians you know, that are very motivated behind this whole, all this thing and putting a lot of time and energy to uh, collect the samples. And so there is a very active consortium in Belgium. It's a small country, but it makes a large contribution proportionately to the, the consortium. All that is going into the, the International IBD Genetics Consortium now, and, I, and it's really a fantastic crowd of, uh, of people. It's a real pleasure to work with them, you know, which people are extremely talented and, and like, you know, including these people, especially Mark Daly, I think he's a fantastic guy. And so these are the, the people in the, in the lab that are doing the work. So Momo was, he's not in the lab anymore, he's back in Riken, but he has uh, initiated a lot of the studies. Ming is doing all the fine mapping uh, work, and we have a series of new uh, uh, PhD students and postdocs uh, of which I better quickly make pictures here, but which are all a very enthusiastic uh, and hardworking crowd that I'm really uh, very thankful uh, to. And I'm very thankful to you as well for your attention. We're going to be very tight on time, but I do think it's important that we have a question or two before we call it quits here. So we'll open it up for a minute. Yeah, so, I, so, so in terms of predisposition? Yeah, so at the present time we have, them, we have uh, so, so I think for, for Crohn's disease, inflammatory bowel disease in general, there is a very slight uh, effect of sex, but compared to many of these other diseases, if I'm correct, it's relatively minor. Nevertheless, what, we are, what one of our students is doing at the present time is analyzing, and I'm a little bit simplifying here, is analyzing the association between SNPs and the disease separately for males and females. In fact, uh, because I, we think it's possible that some effects, 
some SNPs have effects that would be more pronounced in one sex than the other one. So in fact, we look for interaction between sex and SNP effect. And in parallel, he's doing exactly the same thing for the EQTL analysis. And so what we hope is that we'll be able at some point to find some commonality. So what we hope is that uh, there will be sex-specific effects on the disease which will match sex-specific EQTL effects. But so we are... So we see sex-specific effects on EQTLs, some very, not many, but some very, very nice ones. So we see, so we knew that males and females were, di were uh, different, but so we see some EQTLs where one allele increases expression in one sex and decreases the expression in the, uh, in the other sex for reasons which we really would like to understand. One more quick question. <coughs> Well, so, so here, so this is, this is done in healthy individuals. And um, so, so what we do is we, we take uh, uh, four amplicons that are covering the different regions of, so, so we chose for 16 S ribosomal RNA for a number of reasons. But you know, talking with uh, people like Ken Dewar in, in McGill, essentially uh, the, the information you get from the different amplicons is not always perfectly correlated. So what we did was to, so we, we have four different amplicons and we developed linear models in fact to combine the information from these uh, different amplicons so that we have a better estimate of the frequency of the, the different species if you want. So at the present time we have a sequence depth that approaches 100,000 per individual and per uh, location as so we're going to do as much as we can with the data. But the first thing that we will uh, test is to see whether any one of the risk loci, the, the, the risk loci and the risk variants in the, uh, coming out of the GWAS have an effect on, on uh, microbiota composition, knowing that, you know, what does that mean, microbiota composition? So you run into a multiple testing problem as well there, but, uh, but so we'll see whether we can find some, uh, some effect. So I think one way to, because of course you, you have lots of different species and so again, you know, you, you run into this thing, if you do too many tests, you're only, always going to find something that, is, that is, uh, looks interesting, but in fact you, you're just complacent. But I think one way to do it is the same way that we analyze trans EQTL, is to start from the premise that you say, if one of these variants affects the microbiome, I think it's very unlikely that the effect will only be seen on one species. Or at least you could say, at least for some of them, I hope that it will, that it will actually change the composition of the microbiome in a, in a way which is not limited to one of these populations. It's, it's possibly going to affect multiple populations. And so then what you can do is you can do your tests for every population individually but not look at the individual p-values, but rather look at the distribution of the p-values and see whether you have a shift in distributions. So then I think you, you really reduce your multiple testing problem considerably. So that's kind of what we, so we, we had, uh, we can talk about it later, we had some preliminary results that were funny, but that proved to be uh, uh, not genetic at all, although they, they looked like a genetic signal. So what we know is that having an Italian grandmother has a big effect on your microbiome. We have lots of Italians in Liège and, and we try to avoid Italian names amongst the grounds parents to avoid stratification, but some of, some of them slipped through and they generated a big effect in the MHC region, which when looked at in detail was pure stratification, having a Italian grandmother had a big effect on your microbiome. 